whales <laughs> and how the seals really shape um, what the sharks are doing, which Ollie was talking, kind of alluding to earlier in his talk. Um, because if you notice some of those areas where you had red, to make any sense, they're not next to the seal colony, not even close to it. Um, and that's because the seals are kind of driving them there. So, special temporal patterns of white shark predation, so yeah, that's in there, but it's mostly about seals. <laughs> Uh, so, a brief history of nearly everything. Um, I kind of presented this loose idea. I was kind of clutching at straws at the African Marine Mammal Colloquium um, three years ago, geez. Because um, I was working on the whale watching boat and I knew that there was something at Giza Rock interesting happening, um, but I didn't have a clue how to put that all together. So, as you do, you go to talks at UCT and other universities, and I met Alta DeVos who just finished her PhD on how the seals respond to risk around False Bay Seal Island. And while she was giving her presentation, I immediately recognized that that's not what's happening at Giza Rock, what she was saying um, the seals were doing. Um, so obviously, it was time to set up a comparison between the two and take her methodology, apply it to this system, and see if it sticks. But surprisingly, and I say surprisingly because Giza Rock, as it's been mentioned, is a hotbed for commercial activity. There's eight boats out there almost every single day doing shark cage diving. Um, as the boats get bigger, they can go out in even more conditions, so they're, they're, the effort is getting larger and larger. If you ask anybody in Spar and Hans by what the sharks are doing, they can tell you. Um, but there's not actually been a lot of work. So I had to kind of go out there and start from scratch. And I quickly figured out why there's not a lot of work there. Now, Matt, I don't know how you got there in five minutes. I don't know uh, if you knew what boat you were in while you were doing that. Um, but this area is extremely difficult to work in. We're exposed from the west, we're exposed from the northwest, we're exposed from the south, southwest, southeast, east, every condition except for a berg wind <laughs> we are not sheltered from. And traditionally, if you talk to the commercial operators who do have a, a bit of an idea of what's happening, the areas where the sharks were eating seals are in all of those beautiful white breaking waves, um, which regularly happen in wintertime. So as I'm going through my study, you have to understand that I was completely biased to conditions that were less than two meters. So I got about maybe three, if I was lucky, um, survey days in a month. Some months only got one, August I got one. Um, so that's a huge challenge, but obviously telemetry could fix that if I got the money. So just to show you where it's at, again, you can see how exposed it is to everything. That's where the fronts come from, um, and we just get nailed by it. And then the southeast blows in the summer, and we get nailed by that as well. Um, but Giza Rock and Seal Island are very far away. They're about 100 kilometers separated um, as the crow flies. We've got the same species, white sharks, Cape fur seals. Um, some situations even got the same white sharks um, bouncing between the two islands. Um, but yeah, the hunting pattern is just slightly to zoom in a little bit closer, I'll ask you to keep this map in mind because it's incredibly diverse. You've got your island, that's Giza Rock, your 60,000 Cape Fur seals or so. Every year they give birth to between 10 and 12,000 pups. Those pups get weaned in about May, June. That's when they're going off to start fishing on their own and that's when the sharks show up. We've got a whole bunch of rocks, reefs, kelp, I mean shipwrecks, everything is here um, that could possibly be used as a refuge for a seal. So I did the same methodology that Ulta did. She took Seal Island, she split it up into four boxes. I had to do six boxes because that area is just slightly a bit bigger. Um, I'd sit out and, I would say a little research boat, but it wasn't that little, I guess, um, the hindsight. Um, sit on the research boat, 20 minutes, each sector, rotate. I'd pick which sector I started in randomly. Um, and then count seals, count sharks, count predations, pretty much count everything that I saw. Even poachers, and I'm getting to that. Um, obviously six, I didn't patrol on the island. I asked to, but it wasn't allowed to. Um, so obviously six is the smallest of the sectors where I only focused in Shark Alley itself. Um, also, <laughs> towards the end, well not towards the end, probably about halfway through, um, I realized I wasn't seeing much of predations, which I'm also going to get to as well. So I asked the last three friendly cage diving operators in the area uh, to help us with this as well, and uh, to tell me when they saw predations um, and help us with where the sharks were too, um, to really increase the effort because we do not see the kind of predations that happen in false bay. So to do my results, 
I really just want to tell the story of this, so if you want to see the stats, you can read the publication, but if you want stats questions, I can answer them, or theory questions, I can answer them. But really what I'm going to start with is false fade pattern, he's a rock pattern, explanation of difference if I can, and some of them I can't, and there are many, many differences between the two. So your seasonal distribution of white sharks at Seal Island and predations of Seal Island, they're there in winter, not there in summer, classic. And as Matt mentioned earlier, Seal Island can see about 40 predations in two hours. Oh, we did not get that at Keys of Rock whatsoever. And of course, this is what Allison just published. There's a seasonal abundance there at wintertime, and then the shallows in the summertime. So, question number one. Is there a seasonal abundance of white sharks at Keys of Rock in winter? Yes. Fantastic. We're on to a good start. My observations were just simply when a shark circled me, um, when I got approached by a shark, when a shark bit my engine in half, things like that, and mark those down and where I was. Additionally, this got backed up by the spot data, where I took um, all of the pings that we had from the spot data sharks, I turned Giza Rock basically into a listening station, drawing a three kilometer polygon around it, because three kilometers still held in all those reefs that we know the predations were happening. Um, and then everywhere that we had had a surface of a tagged shark, I counted that as a sighting or a, a recording of that shark in the area. And you can see it's clear. May, June, July, August, September, nothing, October, nothing, November, nothing, December, nothing. So they're a very, very, very clear pattern um, of the shark present seasonally. Good. Is it the same as surface predations? I saw 37 surface predations for the entire year. 37. That's what Paul's face sees in the morning. Um, and that's not just me, and that's not just natural predations. That was also when the commercial guys had um, decoy poles. They marked that down for me as well. So we do not have nearly the same amount of effort that's happening in Paul's face. But you see, it does have a clear trend in wintertime. By July, there's a whole bunch of surface predations happening, a whole bunch, for Giza Rock terms. And of course, that correlates when you've got your peak presence of naive seals within the system. So that's kind of interesting, is that it's, it's not necessarily a peak abundance of sharks, it's not necessarily a peak abundance of seals, but it's that peak presence of the naive ones that makes that mortality so high, which I think is interesting if you take it long to human shark conflict after that. So we had a clear pattern. I could say March, August was winter, that's my high risk. That's my comparison to my September, February, summertime, low risk. Not many sharks are on the island, very few predations happening. And then I can draw a line and say, okay, what are the seals doing during summer? What are the seals doing during winter? Spatially, this is what's happening in Pulse Bay. There you go, that's beautiful. It's definitely don't have that going on in Giza Rock. Um, but it's a clear pattern where you've got the most predations happening <coughs> off the island, off your launch pad area, um, towards the direction of the foraging grounds. So the next question I had is, well, do you see that at Giza Rock? Are these spatial patterns confined at Giza Rock the same way that they're confined in False Bay, towards the foraging grounds? Yes. No. No. That doesn't make any sense. The red is winter. The green is summer. So that kind of gives you a bit more of a picture of what's happening as well. So already, those don't make sense. But we'll get to it now. The most predations happening in this system, where they were occurring, was three, straight off the island, that makes sense, that's false bayish. Shark Alley, which Ollie talked about already, how much the sharks are hanging out tight, tight, tight against rocks to pick off seals. And then the Heldstein in five, which doesn't make a lot of sense. To temporal patterns of Seal Island, thanks Alison Cook. Um, it's a sunrise thing. Right after sunrise or at sunrise, that's when the most of the predations are happening. Is that happening at Giza Rock? No. There's a huge decrease. Not much of anything happening in the morning. Now, contrary to popular belief, I was up early enough <laughs> to be out there to see them. Um, next thing you want to look at is what are the seals doing? Well, this is your high risk time. Summertime is your dark green. And then wintertime is your kind of checkerish looking thing there. They do decrease moving to and from the island during that high risk period. That's risk allocation. Interestingly enough, they actually increase their movement at dawn. So that also tells you that there's not a risk during that time. 
Otherwise, they wouldn't be increasing their movement after dawn. It doesn't make much sense. So what could be causing this delay um, in the predation risk of the area? Maybe visibility. That's the kind of theory we're working off of now. I'm open to suggestions about this, because this was something that we all kind of bashed our heads against desks about. Um, visibility is poorest in the morning. It increases in the afternoon. Giza Rock is extremely shallow, uh, especially compared to Seal Island. Off the back of the island, you're at 10 meters, 15 meters depth. You have to go a long ways past the island before you get to 20 meters even. Um, so it could be a fact that there's more wave action in that area. It could be a lot more difficult for a shark to see a seal in those early, early morning um, time periods. And they actually have to wait for the sun to get just a little bit higher before they can actually start identifying seals and killing them. So it could be a situation where the visibility is still too poor to see the seals here. Here, just, just when the sun gets a little bit higher, the sharks can see the seals. Maybe the seals can't quite see the sharks yet. And then in the afternoon, the seals can see sharks. Sharks maybe can see seals. But it doesn't matter because they're not predating there anyway. As Ollie pointed out. And as a seal person, just to go off on a tangent, and I'm known for my tangent, so I apologize, um, this pattern for seal movement to or from a colony does not make any sense. If you look at telemetry, especially what Alta did um, out on Seal Island, during the daytime was your lull of seal activity around the colony. But here at Giza Rock, I had a massive peak, both summer and winter time. So there's something happening all throughout the year that's predictable enough for seals to be going to it from Giza Rock. False Bay is an MPA, Giza Rock isn't. Do you see where I'm going? Um, if you follow one of these seals groups out, they will take you to kilometers upon kilometers upon kilometers of dead fish that have been dumped. Just throwing that out there. Not part of my study, just a tangent to think about. So Shark Alley moving on. Shark Alley, these are when the predations are peaking in Shark Alley in the afternoon. And you're going to say to me now, well, look at your time period. It's way longer than the rest of them. Um, this was to keep with what Alta did. I'm sure Alta had a very intelligent reason for picking those time periods. I just stuck with it because I trust around that. Uh, but even if I do a test of independence against this, um, it's still valid um, as an increase, a marked increase, compared to the rest of the time periods. So by the afternoon, the sharks move into the alley and start nipping off seals from the island. Here's your seal presence within the alley. So again, you see, as that seal presence, whether in the deep or the shallow transect increases, that's when the predations increase in the area too. So your highest abundance of seals in the area. Again, it would be very interesting to see how that relates to beaches and sharks. So there's something clearly interesting happening in Shark Alley. I wanted to take maybe a bit of a closer look into it, especially because you've got this naive versus experienced seal situation happening. It's a really, really good opportunity to test whether or not these seals learn over time to avoid the sharks, or if they just carry on being chomped. So what I did, split it up into a shallow transect and a deep transect, followed those lines. You might be asking yourself, well, what's more dangerous? We see the most predations happening here. But on an average day, in this transect, I would count 150 seals in the water. So if you kind of balance that out, it's actually a bit safer to be in this transect because your buddy's got more of a chance of being killed than you do. Whereas if you're in the deep transect by yourself, you're pretty much guaranteed to be killed. So I wanted to see, well, are seals dumb enough to go in the deep transect? Oh yeah. <laughs> deep winter time? If you're in the deep transect, 18% chance you're going to be in winter time, as opposed to 82% in summer. So they prefer that deep transect in summertime when the sharks are not there. Shallow doesn't make a difference. Winter, summer, there's always seals there. They're always present. So who could be so dumb? Who would be in the deep transect, most dangerous area, during winter? Of course. If you look at the split between the young of year and juvenile, which is your green, your adults and bull seals, which are the black, you see in summertime, January, February, it's evenly split in the deep transect, 50-50. Mostly some, some adults, some bulls, and some juveniles, and some this. By the time winter hits, it's all juveniles. There's not an adult in this right mind that's going into that deep transect. And for good reason, they get nailed pretty easily. So these guys are naive. So the next question is, well, are they learning? Check this out. 
January, February, that's your summertime again, deep in the, uh, um, in the deep transect. March, April, May, June, July, this is again your peaking when your seals are weaning. So there's more and more and more young seals going into the shark alley. Check out August. Snap. They totally drop off. So it's quite possible that by the end of the season, just like what Ulta found with the seals in Seal Island and False Bay, these guys are learning to avoid that deep transect because you either avoid it or you get killed. Pretty easy. So it could be, but I can't prove it on my observations alone, so I need to tag a few seals maybe and check it out. And um, also to see, yeah, we get to that in just a minute. So the spatial patterns of seal movements, now here I'm tricking you, I'm, getting you, I'm pulling you into the pinniped world, because there's lots of interesting things happening here. As we saw for the spatial distribution of surface predations at Pulse Bay, they're mostly happening here. So guess where most of the seals are leaving the island from? Straight off there. But these guys don't have a heck of a lot of choice. There's not really a lot of reef. There's not really much uh, you can do other than just get into a group, a tight group. So you limit your space around the guy next to you, so you hope he gets killed and not you. And you just go. Now what Ulta found is that the adults would learn to avoid that sunrise um, peak in the predations. So it was mostly the juveniles in younger year who didn't know to be smart enough not to leave or come back during that sunrise time because the sharks were picking off. But the adults would learn. So the question at the end of Ulta's thesis was, well, what if there were refuge habitats? What if there was reef? What if there was kelp? What if there were rocks, etc.? Would the seals learn to utilize it? And here we are. <laughs> it all comes full circle. Well, I've got a lot of potential refuge here, so I was very interested to see if the seals are using it or not. So if you look at our spatial patterns of seal movement at Giza Rock, in the summertime, it's a very typical false bay pattern. They're leaving straight off the colony, and there's a bit of movement, a little bit, a little bit of movement through four, not much in one, not much in two, not much in five. Typical. As soon as risk hits, and it turns into winter, and the hunting sharks are there, you get this pattern. Three goes down, four expands, still nothing in five, not much happening in two, nothing in one. That's where the cage diving boats work. That gives you a bit of an indication. But hold on. This doesn't make any sense. There's a crap load of seals going through this reef. <laughs> there are no predations practically happening in that area. There are no seals moving through five. That's the area with the most predations. That doesn't make any sense. So the next question you should ask yourself is, is there refuge? Because if you've got a high overlap of your predator and a high overlap of your prey, but rarely any predation's happening, then there might be a refuge area in that spot. So we took a look. To just, ooh, carry on. Uh, to highlight what I'm saying before, if you do a Jacobson's Prey Selection Index, which looks at how many um, surface predations you're seeing in comparison to your abundance of seals in the area, five is the most dangerous because I didn't see any seals through five. That's a clue. I didn't see any seals through five. Um, and there were lots of seals through four, but not many predations. So what could be the answer to sector four? Maybe there's no sharks in sector four. Ollie proved that wrong already. There's a ton of sharks here. They're using that area a heck of a lot. So it's definitely not that there's no sharks. They're there. Next possibility is that there's a refuge. And if you take a look, there's no underwater topography in Gizarek. There wasn't until about three weeks ago, of course, which is after I turned my thesis. <gasps> um, but if you just take Google Maps over time, you can track what the refuge is doing, or excuse me, the habitats are doing. Your green is where you've got kelp that's visible from the surface, which I took an aerial flight to kind of start that and then confirmed it myself with a handheld GPS, which was very exciting. Um, around the island, of course, you've got your islands, which are your pink. Your reef areas, which I also kind of had an idea myself, but took that from the aerial photographs um, where you had the big breaking swells. Those are reef areas between 5 and 10 meters of depth that break very easily, unfortunately. Um, and yeah, that's, that's, that's the basis of it. And then your deep open water is just your white. So are they using this? Sectors 4 and 5 are the most structurally diverse out of them, barring 6, but that's mostly the island. Whereas the other sectors are pretty deep open water, so you really wouldn't want to be there as a seal, would you? If you're trying to stay away from sharks. So the general pattern with moving through 4 
I, trying to be statistically sound, would sit in the same GPS point every single time I went to four. The seals did not depart that area in the same area every day. They changed it. Sometimes they'd leave through here, maybe here, maybe here, maybe the next hour they were going through here, maybe the next hour they were going through here. So they had this front where literally you could watch the seals, and I've got video footage of them doing this, going into Shark Alley, creeping along the kelp, creeping along the kelp, creeping along the kelp, sitting there bobbing, 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 butts in the air, bobbing, 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 and then three, two, one, go. They're off like a lightning bolt after that. So there's potential here that this cover of kelp gives the seals an area where they can gather information about where maybe the sharks are without the sharks being able to then breach on them and attack them, which allows them to be able to adjust where they're going to leave this kelp barrier hour by hour so they can respond to that risk. Maybe, but I need to limit you to prove it. For five, oh, well, wait, but it could be a seal alley next to Shark Alley. <laughs> For five, there was no seal movement through that area, but there was the most predations. Remember, I'm sat on a boat. I don't know what's going on underneath me at all. And in five, if you'll recall, that's the area with the most reef structure, shallow reef structure. So if you're a seal, it makes sense, especially if you've got limited lung capacity, to rather dive down to that reef, hug it like crazy, and then the only time you're really exposed to a shark is when you're crossing over those reef areas. That was a theory. If that theory is true, the predation should all be occurring on the edge of the reef. Would you look at that? Except for these two random guys, all the surface predations were happening, especially in this channel, where the sharks were hanging out and waiting to pick off seals in between the reef. It's possible, again, but telemetry needs to prove that. I can't prove it myself. So the crucial aspect of the system appears to be kelp for the seals to be able to avoid detection by sharks. Also gives them an area where they can um, gather information about sharks and adjust their movement patterns according to that risk. But who cares? I think you can kind of figure that out um, after a while if you look at the picture. And I think this is very cool because you can see clearly how four is shaped and how they can just kind of duck out and duck back in and duck out and duck back in. But there's something interesting happening in Giza, or around Giza Rock, in Hansba specifically, that has a huge impact on the kelp in the area. Huge. This top predator that I'm talking about is so abundant in this area that I have equal observations of white sharks as I do to this other top predator. And they're, of course, the friendly <laughs> Hans by poacher. So, Allison, I think you took this picture, right? <laughs> but they're a friendly bunch. I mean, if you're a blonde on a boat, you can get away with a lot. This is, I think, two of maybe six boats that were out that day. They favored the same conditions I did, low swell. I saw them a lot. Every day, almost. They're diving in extremely stupid, naive prey areas for a pearly moon, which you may know is an incredible herbivore of kelp. We don't know how many of these guys get killed every year, um, because the only, they're not going to report it, obviously. Um, and only when you get a guy washing up onto the island do you have any indication that someone's been killed. Interesting enough, especially for Jeremy, we found on Dara Island a tattered shark pod. So if you're looking for a study species for <laughs> shark repellents, <laughs> you might want to talk to the poachers in Hans Bay. They will buy it from you. So what's happening here? Just like any other system in this world, if you take out your herbivore, your plants grow like crazy. And we're starting to see that in this area. I've only been at Hans Bay for three years. But already the kelp is different, 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 expanding, expanding, expanding in these areas to the point where there are anchor spots we can't use anymore because they're too overrun with kelp in the same areas that these poachers are operating in. There's no science here, just my observations. Um, there was a massive kelp die-off in 2007, which was attributed to an extremely low tide and hot temperature. Um, and then ever since 2007, the kelp has been going absolutely out of control. Shark Alley is starting to close. The washing machine has closed. This area to uh, Wilfrid's Rock closed. We can't anchor here anymore. Even where we were sat anchored, tagging sharks with O-Search, which is over in this corner, is too kelpy. You can never have a, a boat there now. That's a year. So without a herbivore, we're having this extreme explosion of kelp. There we go. There's another one. You can even see
see the bag there? It's doing all right. Out of interest sake, that's the deep transect in winter time and about the afternoon. So again, very, very naive. So here's something to consider, just to leave off. And there's definitely a potential for a lot of work out here. And um, if the kelp fills shark alley, will we have to rename it kelp alley? Will the sharks keep going into it? Don't really know. Um, and how's that going to go on to affect everything else? How would the increased kelp growth affect seal movement to and from the colony? How would that affect the success of the sharks? And how would that affect the cage diving industry? <coughs> the plot thickens. Um, but I think it might be really interesting and maybe something to throw out there as well for an extra study for someone who's interested in things like kelp or not. Um, but it could be possible that you could look at kelp abundance. I don't know if this has probably already been thought of, but areas where kelp are growing out of control are potential indicators and markers of areas that are being heavily poached. So it might be something worth taking a look into. And with things like Google Maps, where you can go literally back to 2004 and track changes in some of these bays, it might be worth taking a look into, especially in Austin. I'm sure you could see something very clear around there. So that's essentially it. It all comes together in the bigger picture. It's not just seals and sharks or sharks versus seals. It's pearly moon, poachers, kelp, seals, sharks, and everything else that's existing in that system as well. That's it.